John. Yeah, and two others. Moses and Elijah. Elijah. Um, Elijah was on Mount Sinai. Moses was on Mount Sinai. Now they're both with Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. It's quite interesting as Jesus changes a couple things, or a big thing, the difference between his new kingdom and Mount Calvary, Mount Moriah in the Old Testament, and Sinai. What are the big differences between Sinai and Calvary? What are the differences between those two mountains? You can go near Sinai. Why couldn't you go near Sinai? There's like a, just people are scared, like there's thunder and stuff. God's presence were there, and they were afraid. Mm -hmm. Covenant to curse um, and to obey the law. Curse if you don't get the law. Mm -hmm. We're made on Sinai, and a different covenant was made. Yeah, what else? So Mount Sinai. God's glory came down, didn't it? And his finger, I'm not sure what God's finger looks like, but he didn't write the Ten Commandments in a book. Moses did. Uh, God wrote them on tablets. And as he wrote them on tablets, they came down, and like Caleb said, uh, this is what the law says. Do this and you live. You don't do it, you're cursed and you die. What's the problem with that? People can't do it. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. And what's that called? What kind of covenant is that called? Conditional. Conditional covenant, exactly. So if you sign a conditional covenant, if you agree to a conditional covenant, uh, what has to happen? Keep your side. Both sides have to keep their end of the bargain, right? What happens if it's an unconditional covenant? Well, it doesn't matter, does it? So when uh, they were under this conditional covenant, do this and live, don't, and if you do it, you die, you're under a curse. That's a conditional covenant. Um, there's, there's pictures of the unconditional covenant. And so uh, Abraham made a covenant, and he cut these animals in half, and uh, he put them on the sides, and what would happen is the blood would flow to the middle. And as the blood flowed to the middle, the two people who make the, the covenant are supposed to walk between the sacrifices, and their feet would walk through the blood. And what they were saying is, if I don't keep my end of the bargain, what happened to these animals should happen to me. But you see, Abraham had a nap. God put him to sleep. And God alone walked between the sacrifices. And he made an unconditional covenant with Abraham. And that same idea about an unconditional covenant is what you and I have in Jesus Christ. There's only one thing you have to do to be saved. What is it? Believe. I guess that's the very minimum you have to do for a covenant, isn't it? You have to believe that the covenant exists. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd never agree to it. So you have to believe. What else do you have to do? Do you have to go to church? Do you have to go to Lord's Supper? Do you got to wear a dress? Or a suit? Do you have to have short hair? No. Do you have to have long hair? No. Do you have to wear makeup? No. Do you not have to wear makeup? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to give money? Do you have to be baptized? 
do you have to witness for a certain amount of hours every month? Um, do you have to go to national conventions? Do you have to go to international conventions? <coughs> what do you have to do? You leave. That's all. I, do, you, do you have to be a boy? Do you have to be a girl? Do you have to be young? Do you have to be old? Do you have to be in between? Do you have to be university educated? Can you be a child? Can you be an old person? Can you be somebody who doesn't know how to read? Do you have to write books? Do you have to have a certain amount of money in your bank account? Do you have to have a certain level of poverty? Do you have to know how to drive? Some of the things I said sounded kind of stupid. Uh, but there are religions that teach those things. If you don't witness for four hours once a week, you know, you, you're not part of the church. And I know you don't want to go to sleep, so we're going to give you a wake magazine. <laughs> if you don't give your tithe every week, you have a debt with the church. If you don't come to church, if you don't get baptized by our church, if you're not married in our church, if you don't do something for the church, like drive the church bus, because that's sort of like uh, purgatory for Christians that they have to drive the church bus and pick up the kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Try to teach Sunday school. There's places that teach those things. But all you have to do is believe. Why is it believe the only thing you have to do with Jesus? Because anything else would diminish his word. Anything Any else word. would, that was the word I was looking for, his complete work. What a brilliant answer. So when Caleb says his complete work, what does that mean? His work or saving us? Just he paid it. He did everything that needed to be done. All you got to do is believe it. Anything else diminishes exactly what he said. His complete work in salvation. And so uh, the unconditional covenant says it doesn't depend on you. It depends on what Jesus did. And if he did it perfectly and he could say it is finished. Or do you say, well, I'm half done. You've got to do the other half. You know, Annika, if you don't read your Bible every day, you're going to go to hell. How many of us would be in hell because reading our Bible every day was a rule for salvation? Good thing that's not a rule, isn't it? <laughs> you know, if you don't pray every day, that's the end of your salvation, you know? How many of us would not have salvation if we had to pray every day? Well, I think I pray every day, but there might have been a day or two I missed. I don't remember. You see, it doesn't depend on works of righteousness that we've done. It depends on everything that Jesus did. And so... Uh, when he says the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for everybody. And he's making this unconditional covenant. It's an awesome thing. And it's showing that Jesus completely saves everybody who trusts in him. He doesn't just partially save. I know. And I think I know what we mean when we say he's almost saved. But there's no such thing as almost saved, is there? You're either saved or you're not. And, and so on the Mount of Transfiguration where uh, the glory of God shines and then all of a sudden Jesus starts to shine, doesn't he? And Jay mentioned whiter than the whitest the cleaner could ever make your clothes shining. When Jesus was saying there on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know what? 
I'm the glory of God on earth. Look at me shine. Just like what happened to Moses when he was on Mount Sinai. Do you remember his face shone? And then he had to sort of cover it up because he was sort of embarrassed that his face was shining. Uh, but he's actually more embarrassed that the light and the sh shining part was fading. Because when he was in God's very presence, he shone bright. And then as he moved away from God's presence, because he was physically walking away from God and his time passed, that glory was fleeting and disappearing. That's what the book of Corinthians would say. But Jesus just started shining. And he wasn't the reflection of the glory of God. He was and is the glory of God. And he's the physical embodiment of God's glory, the glorious God of Israel. He was a servant. And that's important to us. And at the end of this, this section, just before he gets to Jerusalem, the disciples are still confused. <laughs> what? How can he be the embodiment of God's glory and be a servant? That's also backwards to the way I think. Because you see, the way you think is sort of like the Queen of Sheba. How did the Queen of Sheba think? She saw the glorious clothes of the servants of Solomon. And what'd she say? I saw how you were servants were arrayed. I, I'm sorry, I heard about how your servants were arrayed. I heard how they were dressed. I didn't really believe it. But you know, I came and I saw it. And, and you know, they actually didn't even tell me the half of it. This is way better than anybody ever told me. <coughs> I've seen a couple places in the world uh, where the, re the pictures don't do justice to the reality. So once we went to the Grand Canyon. So if you ever come to visit us in Mexico, the Grand Canyon is only about a nine hour drive from where we live. And it's not too far. Uh, but I've seen lots of pictures of the Grand Canyon. I've seen it on videos, National Geographic, and all those things. But when you see the Grand Canyon in real life, you think, wow. And the pictures didn't do justice to what the Grand Canyon looks like. That's what the Queen of Sheba was thinking when she saw Solomon's servants. And then she saw Solomon. And the half, she didn't think, they didn't, they didn't do you justice, man. You're way more glorious than they ever told me. Now, do you remember Jesus saying something about Solomon's, the way he was dressed? Not even Solomon in all his glory is dressed like one of these little... Lilies and flowers. You know, a greater than Solomon is here, said the Lord Jesus. You thought Solomon was glorious? He's nothing compared to these lilies. And these lilies are nothing compared to the Lord Jesus. And the people are just scratching their heads thinking, how is being a servant glorious? You see, they're not putting the two. So at the end of the first section, they're left scratching their heads. At the end of the second section, they're left scratching their heads. And so they go on to the third section. Now Jesus is in Jerusalem. He enters, just like he did in Matthew, on the uh, full of an ass. And he goes in, and they do the exact same thing as, as they did in Matthew. And then he cleanses the temple, and he shows his authority. And then Jesus starts teaching for the next week. He's teaching just like he did in Matthew. And he's telling them all these things. And he's mostly uh, arguing, debating with the religious leaders. And because he keeps putting them to shame, because they understand 
what Jesus is saying is true about them. Hmm. You know, what if somebody knows the truth about you? They can see right through everything. Would you rather that person not sort of be around just in case they say something to the wrong person? <laughs> Ooh, they're here. I think I just sort of... It's my bedtime already. 6.30. Time to go home. Oh, got to get up early in the morning, 9 o'clock. Well, for some of us, that's early in the morning. And so they plan to, to kill the Lord Jesus. In chapter 13, uh, he prophesies that Jerusalem will be destroyed and the temple will be destroyed. Um, and that his disciples would be persecuted just like he was. Chapter 14, we have the Passover again. And those symbols are provided again. Then he's arrested and then his trial and his crucifixion. Then the darkness descends. It's the very opposite of the transfiguration, isn't it? Transfiguration is glowing. On Calvary, the lights go up. Why do the lights go up? Why did God shut off the lights for three hours? Because Satan ruled? Well, never thought of it that way, but maybe. Maybe it appeared that at that particular moment, he who has the keys to death uh, might have appeared to be winning. No, oh, that's not really the thing I was thinking about, though. How ugly is sin? <coughs> it's a lot uglier than most of us think. And it's so ugly, in fact, that God shut off the lights of the world. Paul would write to the Corinthians and say that he who knew no sin was made sin. What do you think it was for that perfect holy Lamb of God to be made sin? Your sin. My sin. Think of the worst thing you ever did. And there are how many? 25 of us in this room? 25, the very worst thing we ever did. Plus, you add on to that the 7.5 billion people on the face of the earth right now. Plus, you add on to that the 7.5 billion people who've died already. Huh. And that's just taking one of their sins, the very worst of their sins, and putting it on the Lord Jesus. The perfect one, the holy one. Do you think that would be a pretty sight? So in Mexico, they have this weird thing. They think Canadians are barbarians because all Canadians go heart seal hunting, baby seal hunting. Uh, that's what Canadians do. For fun, we put on skates and we become barbarians on ice. That's what all Canadians do. <laughs> right, Marcus? Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to say is they, they see a picture of a baby seal being plucked. Uh, and they don't think that's a pretty picture. And probably in reality, it's not the prettiest picture. Probably not something somebody should videotape. Um, 
Well, let's just suppose one statement was just like one of those. How many sins have you ever done in your life? How many sins have been committed by this world? And all those were put on the pure and holy Son of God. Now, you probably shouldn't film a video of a baby seal getting beaten, bludgeoned, killed. Uh, how much worse would it be to bear the sin of the world? You see, that's why God shut off the lights so nobody would have to ever see him bearing their own sin. And God shut off the lights. And Jesus cries out. <coughs> um, there's a soldier at the foot of the cross. And he was the first one to know anything about the Lord Jesus. What did he say? Surely this man. Surely this man is the son of God. Who was the first to take note? A Gentile soldier. He may very have well been one of the ones that nailed him to the cross. He may not have been, but there he was. So he may have been one of the ones. And that was his testimony. Um, and then we have the resurrection. And the resurrection happens, and these two gals go to the tomb. And they're met there at the tomb. Uh, what happens when they get to the tomb? Stones roll away. Stones rolled away, and then they run away. <laughs> you see, they were they were confused. <laughs> and then the book of Mark sort of ends, and then there's sort of a PS. We'll get to the PS in a second. Why do you think it ends with the people being confused? Every section, they're wondering, is what's going on here? Because they weren't taught the word of God from God's perspective. I don't know that so they weren't taught. I think it's more like they weren't seeing it from God's perspective. But it's also to do with you know, everybody has to make their own decision about who Jesus is. And it's okay to be confused. What's not okay is to stay confused. Peter messed up, didn't he? How many times did Peter mess up? He said he's the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, you know, you're right, but he sort of got a little bit wrong. Did Peter ever mess up after that? Yes. When else did he mess up? Many times. He disowned him. He said, I, I ain't one of his dogs. He started swearing, just like the fisherman that he was. Did he ever mess up again? Yeah. Yeah, you got to live like a Jew. If you don't live like a Jew, you can't be a Christian. And Paul opposed him face to face immediately there in Galatians. Um, but he, despite his mix-ups every now and then, despite his messes, uh, he had decided that his confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, was actually right. And even though sometimes he had misconceptions and, and, and weird ideas about what that meant, still in his heart of hearts, realize that Jesus was the only hope. And for you and I, that should be encouraging for us. Because Jesus can do everything he said he can do. And that's why it gives you and I hope. What if Jesus couldn't do everything he said he could do?
then we wouldn't have any hope, would we? But Jesus did everything. And then there's a PS. <coughs> And says, go preach this to every creature. But it just ends abruptly. Suffering servant is the Messiah. And he leaves the reader to have to decide, is Jesus who he says he is, or is he a fraud? It's for you to decide, is Jesus who he says he is, or is he a fraud? Uh, are you going to run away like the women did? Or are you going to do what he says? Go and preach the gospel to every creature. They said that when Billy Graham was young, he would preach to the chickens and the cows. But it's with the every creature part. By the time he was 12 or 13, he had graduated from chickens in the farm. Uh, to drunkards outside the bar. And as he got older, and as God used him, he preached to millions of people around the world. Um, I remember uh, the week he died, I was teaching a Bible study in Vancouver. There were 14 people at this Bible study. Of the 14, eight of them got saved in 1986. I think it was 86 when Billy Graham was preaching in BC Place. 1986, now it's 2019. Or then it was 2019, I think. It was 2018, I don't quite remember when he passed, but eight out of the 14 got saved when he was preaching and they were still carrying on 30 years later. You see, he was found faithful because he deemed the one who called him as faithful. He decided Jesus was who he said he was, and he started preaching the gospel to chickens and cows, graduated up to drunkards outside of bars, and God still counted him faithful and used him to preach to millions all over the world. That's why you guys are here, isn't it? Maybe you're not ready to the millions around the world quite yet. But we have to start with the chickens and the cows. We graduate from there to children. That's why we want to do camp. Because we found that Jesus is able to do everything that we've committed unto him against that day. And he can do exceedingly abundantly above everything we ask or think. What were we asking on Sunday night when we were praying? What are some of the things? How will preserve the camp? Has he? Yeah. So far? Yeah. Yeah. Is he able? Yeah. 65 years ago, Mr. Campbell and Mr. Lynn had a vision. Have fires ever sort of threatened camp before? Is camp still standing? Josh prayed something like this. Well, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to keep it. But we think it's still being used. It's absolutely true. If God wants to start all over, he can start all over. If God wants to send us all home, he can send us all home. That's not a problem for him. But we found him faithful. That's why we have good news to tell everybody. That's why those children are so important. That's why you wrote cards to the ones that couldn't come this week. That's why Josh is trying to figure out a way to get those kids that couldn't come this week into the next week and the week after. Some way, somehow. Because that's what the important thing is, isn't it? If he's our master, we're his servants. We're not better than our master, are we? 
And so uh, that's what the book of Mark's sort of kind of about. It leaves you wondering if the Messiah I have in my mind is the same one as the Bible. Is it the same one Jesus is revealing? And as he adjusts our way of thinking, we find him extremely faithful. He's a servant that always did what he said, was able to do exceedingly abundantly, above everything we asked of him. And that's why we're here this summer, to do his good will. <coughs> Questions or comments on the Gospel of Mark? Um, why was the first three hours not dark then? Because um, I thought the darkness was part of judgment. Uh huh. So, so um, God, like the physical suffering was also part of judgment, but I guess like different parts. I think that. Physical suffering, if you, anybody see the movie, The Passion of Christ, that Mel Gibson did? Some of us have, some of us haven't. Um, it was, what was the word? Rumor had it was much too gory for Christians to go see. It wasn't as glory as Hacksaw Ridge, but that's besides the point. Uh, but you see, who inflicted the physical suffering on the Lord Jesus? Man. This was the worst that man could do. Man was judging Jesus, and man found Jesus despicable, rejected. <coughs> then God turned out the lights, and then who judged him? And all your sins, all your sins, all your sins, your sins, your sins, your sins, all of our sins were put on him and judged on him in the darkness. It's not man's judgment. That was all the physical stuff. And the physical stuff showed man's rejection of Jesus Christ. When God shut off the lights, he was bearing our sin. And God was judging our sin on him. The physical was absolutely nothing. He doesn't say, what are you doing this to me for? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He says, son, here's your mom. Mom, here's your new son. But God shuts off the lights, and what does he say? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Our fathers cried unto you, and you heard their voices. Why art thou so far from hearing me? See, everybody from Adam all the way through to Malachi was a sinner. And when they cried out to God, God delivered them. But why are you so far? I never sinned. I never ever rejected you. Why are you so far away from hearing my voice? I'm not a man, he says. I'm a tola. I'm a worm. I'm that little worm that you squish and you pulverize. whose blood you use to make the red dye in your fabrics. That's who I am. That's why you didn't hear my voice. Because I was being made sin for Caleb and Ian and Ben and Matt and Marcus and Caleb. I was bearing their sin. I'm a worm and not even a man. And so as he bore our sin, as God laid on him the iniquity of all of us, 
Please shut out the lights. If people in Mexico don't want to see some new feet beating up a, a seal, how much worse is the Son of God being judged for sins he didn't do? And then God turned on the lights when the darkness was broken by that sound of my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we hear the, the words, it's finished. We hear the words, into your hands I commend my spirit. You see, Jesus was in complete control the whole time. And it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. Was Jesus a man? Yeah. Did he die? Was he judged? Yeah. And God said, this man's innocent. Just like Pilate and Herod did. <laughs> Except Pilate and Herod just let him die anyways. God said, this man's innocent. And when God declared him innocent, death had to let him go. He arose again on the third day. Proving that in him was no sin, that he did no sin. He knew no sin. The sin he died for was our sin. It wasn't his own because if it was his own, he would have stayed dead. But he died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So the physical thing wasn't the big thing. The physical thing was man's rejection of Jesus as Messiah. The darkness is when God judged him. And laid all of our sins upon him. He bore them all. Even the ones we haven't done yet. Even the ones we think right now, that's so shameful. Jesus paid the price for that one. And that's why when we get together on Sunday mornings, we're so thankful to the Lord for saving us, aren't we? This is the new covenant. It's an unconditional covenant in his blood. It doesn't depend on anything you do except for believing because Jesus did it all. And to prove it, he rose again on the third day saying, you know what? There's absolutely nothing you need to do, Danny. There's nothing you need to do, Katie. You believed I paid all the price. So that's why. The darkness was only three hours. Any other comments? Father, we would just like to thank you again for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he came as a servant. We thank you that he gave his life a ransom for us. We're thankful that he was such a good servant, that he was obedient even unto death, even the cruel death of the cross. We're thankful that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son, and that your only begotten son served you with all his heart and all his soul and all of his strength. We're thankful that Jesus paid it all and now I suppose we say like the hymn writer, and all to him we owe, sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. Just like the author Mark said about the Lord Jesus. And now we have his righteousness. Now we have the clothes of salvation on and we can't be any more precious in your sight than we are right now. You loved us when we were yet sinners. And now we're children of God. We thank you so much for that great privilege and that great calling. We thank you for so great a salvation. And so as we end our 
official Bible study for today. We ask that the savor of Jesus as King, the savor of Jesus as servant, and the savor of us being here for such a time as this would richly dwell in our hearts and minds. And that we'll be more enamored with you a little bit later than we were yesterday. So help us, we pray, to keep falling in love day after day with your son. He's so much more and the half hasn't been told. And we pray that you would reveal that other half to us and that we would honor him with all of our lives. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.